Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Today we'll be talking about sensors and actuators and then we'll move on to uh, linear control of manipulators. So in the last class what we looked at is a uh, basic definition of sensors that uh, sensors can be classified as internal sensors or external sensors and internal sensors are basically required for the working of the system. So essentially uh, the internal sensors like potentiometers the, or encoder, they basically give the joint feedback. So essentially when a, a robot link is moving, we need to know where the joint is in a particular uh, instant of time. And that feedback is coming from our feedback sensors, uh, uh, position feedback like encoder, potentiometer, etc. Now uh, let us proceed today, uh, very briefly uh, revise at what we had done in the previous class. And in the previous class we looked at sensors and uh, this was the basic layout of what we were discussing that the control system essentially has four parts and the four parts are the controller, then we have uh, an actuator uh, which actually moves, uh, then we have the link which is the uh, element of the robot which is moving and uh, we have a feedback device which is an encoder. So this is what we call by our closed loop uh, feedback system. So uh, every joint will have uh, or the robot as such will be controlled by a feedback, closed loop feedback uh, system which will have a controller an actuator, a feedback sensor and which is going to be uh, working in uh, closed loop fashion. So in the last class we looked at uh, the basic definitions, we said that uh, the basic definition of uh, actuator is it needs to convert energy, so from here uh, energy is converted uh, from electrical, uh, energy is converted to mechanical energy in the actuator here, then the, uh, the uh, mechanical energy moves the link in this direction. Okay, and uh, this motion which is mechanical energy is converted back into electrical energy by your encoder uh, or uh, position sensor and then it is fed back to the controller. So the controller is basically electrical and uh, because of this it can read only electrical signals and uh, due to this reason uh, the feedback also has to be in, in a way that the controller can understand and that is the reason why we need a uh, optical encoder and then we need a feedback sensor. Okay. So the definition of uh, uh, sensor and actuator is essentially it converts energy one from to another. So uh, an actuator converts electrical energy to, mecha to mechanical energy, a sensor converts mechanical energy to electrical energy and this electrical energy is then compared ultimately in the, uh, the controller. So uh, we talked about closed loop control and open loop uh, control, so in, close, in open loop control there is no feedback, so there is no feedback here whereas in closed loop control there is a feedback. And, uh, and hence the name uh, closed loop control. Uh, we also saw that sensors can be classified into two basic ways, one is internal sensors, they are required for the basic working of the system and external sensors that are required for interaction with the environment. And the internal sensors we covered in the last class were basically position, velocity and acceleration and uh, today we will be looking at external sensors and we will be looking at actuators. So very quickly go, uh, revising is we talked about a potentiometer, so you are all familiar with how a potentiometer works. So a potentiometer basically works uh, by, by measuring uh, the difference in uh, resistance, so uh, this, uh, this wiper which is going to move is fixed to the link and when the wiper moves we can see the ratio of the small r to the capital R uh, is going to change. So capital R is the total resistance from here to here and uh, small r is the small resistance from here to here. So whatever voltage we are going to give is going to get multiplied into that and that is going to give me a ratio. So after calibration uh, we can exactly find out uh, depending on the voltage that where this, uh, this, uh, this moving wiper is. So this is the working of a basic potentiometer, encoder basically works on the principle of emitter uh, receiver. So if I draw the side view of this, essentially we have an encoder and this is my axis, so this is my central axis of the encoder. So what you can see here, if I draw it in a little bit, uh, in a little bit enlarged fashion, then it is going to be, there are slots which are like this, okay, so this is this part. Uh, so this is opaque, this is transparent, which means light can go through it and uh, this one uh, and this other part here, uh, the other part here is opaque. 
So this opaque part light will not go through. So essentially on one side we have an emitter and on the other side we have a receiver and whenever light goes through it gets a signal of 1 and when light does not go through it gives a signal of 0. So essentially an encoder will be giving a, an output of 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 as uh, light goes through or light does not go through. And uh, if there are, uh, we know exactly what is the spacing here. So we know the difference. So this is corresponding to 1, this corresponding to 0, 1, this is 0 again, 1 in that order. So if I know what is the spacing from here to here, then I also know that what is the distance, angular distance between any two signals. Okay? So essentially from here we can find out that what is the, the, the angle it has moved between any two signals. Now if I take the, so if I know the time, say it has moved from here to here in time del t, then essentially I know what is the distance covered, so I know what is theta. I also know the velocity because I know theta uh, by what is the total distance, that is this much say del theta by del t, so I know the velocity also. So encoder also gives us a position, it also gives us velocity and if I take the second derivative of this, I can also get theta double dot which is uh, acceleration. So an encoder gives us position, velocity and acceleration. Now uh, to increase the resolution of an encoder, what is done is we do not use one encoder, so we use two encoders or three encoders in parallel. Okay? And uh, what how it works essentially is that the basic structure is the same. We have another emitter receiver here. and uh, what would happen is if I have two encoders in sitting in parallel, if I can draw, if I draw one here and I draw another one there, just sitting, this one has a hole here, this one has a hole here, then a hole here. So this is this one. The fellow which is sitting behind would have holes which are slightly phase shifted. So there is some phase shift between this hole here and here. So there is a phase shift there, if you can uh, understand that. So what would happen is there would be some delay, there would be some lag or some lead in the signal. And that is basically shown in encoder A, if we call this encoder A and we call this encoder B, then this is the signal for encoder A, this is the signal for encoder B. And if you use an XOR gate, so if you use an XOR gate, which basically means that uh, whenever there is a change in signal A or signal B, then uh, there would be a change in the corresponding output signal. So input to this XOR gate is A and B and the output is this. So you can see this very clearly that uh, for the two signals A and B. So A signal there is no change, so here also there is no change. The moment there is a change there, there is a corresponding change here. Again this is remaining constant, this is remaining constant. Now in signal B suddenly a change is coming at this point. So corresponding to this change we have a change here, now this is coming down. Okay? So this is uh, how an XOR gate functions and uh, basically what, uh, what we are getting as an output has a double resolution. So what this basically means is that you had one signal from here to here. right? Now uh, in this one signal you are finding that in this output signal here you are getting two signal, one here and one there. Okay? So your resolution of the system is become going up by two times. So if I use more number of encoders in parallel then the resolution goes up that many number of times. So this is a way in which industrial encoders are used and in industries we have one or two encoders which are sitting in parallel with some phase shift as uh, explained here. And uh, we XOR the signals and get a more uh, uh, better a higher resolution signal as shown uh, here. Okay, so this is my final signal which is coming out from A and B. Now the other question that comes up is how do we check for direction? So we check for direction uh, by using this signal again such that we have an emitter receiver pair, one emitter receiver is here, another emitter receiver is there. So what we do is we put one more emitter receiver here okay, and we look at the phase shifts. So if you look at the phase shift between this signal and that signal, then we can figure out which side it is moving or there is one way. The other way is if you have two encoders, say for example I have uh, one emitter and two receivers. I have one receiver 1 and receiver 2, so R1, R2 are receivers. Okay? And uh, depending on the signal that is coming in R1 and R2 because there is a phase shift, we know how much is the phase shift between these two emitter, uh, between these two receivers, then essentially we can find out which signal is leading and which signal is lagging. So using that we can make out the direction of rotation. So uh, encoders can give us uh, the direction of rotation by using uh, suit, uh, by suitably placing emitter receivers and by using the XOR gate we can increase the resolution. So from an encoder which is very very simple device, we can get the position, we can get velocity, we can get acceleration. Now uh, these encoders are very very cheap because as you can see that they are basically a plastic strip which has a number of slots cut inside. So in terms of cost, it costs nothing. And the output of this encoders is essentially a 1010 kind of signal. So this is again a digital signal which the controller can read directly. 
Okay, so there is no conversion required there. So that is the reason why encoders are used extensively in uh, all motor control applications. So in all industrial motor control, in robot motor control, it is an incremental encoder which is used. Uh, the disadvantage of this is that it is an incremental device, which means that there is no absolute position here. So if you want absolute position, then this basically shows the working of an absolute encoder, which works very similar to that of the incremental encoder. The only difference being that we have a number of, uh, so in the incremental encoder, we had one ring here, which had uh, cuts in there, opaque and transparent parts. In the absolute encoder, we have three rings. We have one, two, three, and four. So four rows are there. And the working is exactly the same. So, in, so if I take the side view of this, we now have four emitter receivers. So we have four emitter receivers. So E1, E2, E3, and E4 are four emitters. And correspondingly, we have four receivers. Okay. So this is R1, R2, R3, and R4. And the working is exactly the same. Light will go through or light will not go through. So essentially, in the previous case, we were getting one rows of zero ones. Here we'll be getting, depend as there are four channels here, we'll be getting four, uh, four bits as an output. So depending on the combination, for example, this is 0, 0, 0, 0, this is 1, 0, 0, 0. So this fellow, if I say 0, 0, 0, 0, and this one is 1, 0, 0, 0, okay? So or the other way around, let's say it is uh, 0, 0, 0, 1. If I'm counting from this side, then it is 0, 0, 0, 1, okay? So depending on that, we can make out where exactly it is, whether it's on this sector or it's on this sector. Now, if you'll see here, each of the sectors are unique, okay? So wherever, whichever sector it is on, uh, we can exactly know where that sector, uh, uh, what is the angle of that sector, what is the absolute position of that sector. And these are called absolute encoders. And uh, uh, the disadvantage of this is that now you have four rows of uh, emitter receiver pairs, plus you need to have some, some kind of uh, logic circuits, which will exactly tell that on which sector it is on. So the cost of the system is more. So the cost goes up of these systems. And uh, uh, that is one of the reasons why this is not used that much. So uh, uh, in about 99% of position measuring devices, we use the incremental encoder. And uh, incremental encoder is enough to give us position velocity acceleration. If you, if you need absolute encoding, then absolute encoder is this one, although it is not uh, used because the cost goes up, uh, control system complicacy goes up, et cetera. Uh, motors, DC motors, you know uh, how it works. So essentially, DC motors have, uh, they work uh, on the principle of uh, reaction between two magnetic fields. So here's a motor and there's a permanent magnet. So this is my permanent magnet, which is the uh, stator. So this is the stator, which does not move. So this does not move. And we have the rotor, which is uh, a coil. Okay. So when we uh, energize this coil, what happens? It produces a magnetic field. So the magnetic field produced by this one will interact with the magnetic field of the, of the uh, stator, the permanent magnetic field, and it will produce a, a rotation. Okay. So it is going to produce a torque, which will cause this coil to rotate. And uh, this is the basic uh, working principle of a, of a brushed. So this is a brushed uh, DC motor. And these are the brushes. So in order to change the polarity, what is done is basically the contact is made by means of this commutator and uh, brushes. So when this rotates, what would happen is the polarity would change automatically. And uh, uh, so uh, the disadvantage being that because these are brushes, what will happen? They will wear off. So wear and tear will be there. Plus there is uh, friction here. And uh, there is chance of spark. Okay. So these are three uh, problems that come up. One is uh, wear tear of the carbon brush, then friction, and then uh, sparking. And uh, cost-wise, these are low, low cost devices, but are not used in industrial applications, essentially because of these three problems that uh, there is wear and tear of the brush, friction, and sparking. So what is done in industrial applications is essentially we use brushless motors. Okay. But before we go to brushless motors, and before we go to actuators, this, the objective of this uh, was not as an actuator, but it was as a sensor. Okay. So how does this work as a sensor? There is a definite relationship between the speed, between voltage versus speed. So this is my speed versus voltage graph. Okay. So the speed versus voltage graph is almost a straight line. So if you want to measure the velocity and you want to measure the acceleration, then we can use a DC motor. So uh, this DC motor can be used as an actuator. It can also be used as a sensor. So when it is rotating, we can fix the link here. So this is my robot link, which is fixed to the link. And I measure the voltage. And if I measure the voltage, I know exactly what is the speed. 
So, uh, if I know the speed and I take its uh, derivative, then I can also find acceleration, right. So, this DC motor can be used as an actuator, it can be used as a sensor uh, uh, and a sens for sensing speed as well as acceleration. And uh, when we are using it for measuring speed and acceleration, we call it a tachometer. Okay. So, a tachymotor is nothing but a DC motor which is exactly this one uh, which is used for measuring speed. Now, how do we measure speed? We just check the voltage and for this corresponding voltage we know what is the speed from the calibration chart here. Okay. So, uh, that is essentially how the motor can be used as a sensor also. Now, uh, we move on next to the other sensors which are there uh, but are external sensors. So, these are external, uh, external sensors and are used for interaction with the environment. We said that a motor uh, that a uh, robot normally would have a use uh, would normally use an encoder. Now, if it uses an encoder, it does not have any absolute position because this is incremental. So, there has to be some way of finding out where is the 0, 0, 0 of the system and to find out that uh, 0, 0 of to find out the origin of a system whether it is a robot or it is a CNC machine. Okay, say for example, a robot uh, or a CNC machine then what we do is we use uh, on off switches or what we call limit switches. So, these are also called limit switches. So, using this limit switches we can find out what is the origin, where is the 0, 0, 0 of the system. So, when the system actually starts uh, you would find that it is going to calibrate the 0, 0, 0 first and then it will start. Okay, that is because it is using incremental encoders. Now, uh, so this is an on off switch, on off switch is very, very easy. It is like the normal light switch that we use. Uh, so, there is contact and no contact and uh, so there would be uh, a, a pad having pressure. For example, there is a, a very simple contact switch would be something like this. Okay. So, this is uh, and uh, there is a, say plus here and there is minus, minus has been given to this fellow. Okay. So, this is minus. Okay. So, what is done if you push it, what will happen? This will come and make contact with that. So, once you make contact with it, what happens? It shorts here and it understands that it becomes 1. So, a limit switch essentially works on 0 or 1. So, these limit switches are also there on the uh, keyboards, say computer keyboard. So, a computer keyboard also uses limit switches, calculators use limit switch. So, if you look at the computer keyboard, if you have ever opened one, what you will see is that there is a there is a conductive rubber layer like this okay? and on the bottom there is a, uh, there is a, uh, a PCB. Okay. The printed circuit board is there and this is my key which is sitting on there. So, what would happen is if I press here, this will come down and it will short here. Okay. So, in this place there is going to be a circuit something of this nature. So, this is the circuit diagram which is kept there. So, one side is plus, the other side is minus. So, if I take e the enlarged view here. So, when I am shorting it what is happening, this is coming and sitting on this. So, this is coming and sitting, if I change the color and draw in some of the color. So, this is, this is coming and shorting. So, if it is coming and sitting on this now, what will happen is this is shorting with that now okay, because this is conductive rubber. So, once it shorts this becomes 1. So, when it is not shorting it is 0. So, essentially the signal is 0 and 1. This is how essentially a limit switch uh, works which is similar to our light switches. Then we have emitter receiver pairs and we have thermal, thermal and uh, uh, pressure sensors. So, let us look at them uh, one by one because these are required for uh, sensing proximity uh, like a mobile robot which is moving, it, it does not have to hit a wall. So, essentially if it has to avoid hitting the wall, it has to uh, detect that there is a wall or an obstacle in front. How does it do that uh, is uh, done by using uh, proximity sensors. So, these proximity sensors, they check for proximity as the name indicates. So, proximity basically means how near you are to, to an object and uh, how does it work is very, very simple. There, there are quite a few of this uh, systems working, uh, sorry, there are quite a few of types of different types of these sensors and how it works at uh, the figure here. So, what what we have is a permanent magnet here. So, this is a north south uh, permanent magnet and we have a, uh, we have a, we have a cylinder here and on the cylinder we have coils which are wound. So, we have a cylinder like this, okay, so if you can imagine at the magnet at the back side and there is windings out here because okay, so these are the windings of copper coils. Now, in the normal condition what would happen is the magnetic lines of force will be going like this which means they are not cutting the coils if you can look at this figure. Now, uh, if the if they are not going through the coils there is no induced EMF. So, 
So there is no uh, induced EMF as long as the magnetic lines of force are not cutting the coils. But the moment something comes in front, if you look here, what is happening an object is coming here in front. The moment an object comes in front because of magnetic induction, what will happen? The lines of force will be pulled into, uh, pulled outward uh, because of induced uh, magnetism and uh, the lines of force will be going like this now. Now this has to be iron or steel or it has to be ferromagnetic. So it has to be a ferromagnetic uh, uh, object. So if you look at this and if you look at this, here the magnetic lines of force are not cutting, here the magnetic lines of force are cutting. So from to go from here to here, what would happen is because the magnetic lines of force are cutting this coil and EMF uh, would be induced in these coils and uh, that would give a signal of 1. Okay. So essentially this also works with 0 or 1. 0 means uh, this condition in which magnetic lines of force are not cutting the coil, 1 means when the mag magnetic lines of force have just cut the coil and induced an EMF. So this is the working of a proximity sensor and this type of uh, proximity sensor is called an inductive sensor essentially because it is inducing and uh, uh, it is inducing a magnetic uh, field uh, in a ferromagnetic materi material which is coming in front. The second kind of, uh, now something to note that this will not work, this will not work uh, with non-ferromagnetic materials. So non-ferromagnetic uh, materials, so non-ferromagnetic materials it is not going to work. So this will not work with uh, non-ferromagnetic uh, materials, this is something to keep in mind. Now the second kind of sensor that we have is a proximity sensor which is called the Hall effect sensor and uh, this also uses magnetic uh, lines of force uh, to work and how it works essentially is uh, if you look at this figure we have a horseshoe kind of a magnet, north and south magnet and the Hall effect sensor is there. So in, if there is nothing in front, so this is uh, nothing in front, no object in front, the magnetic lines of force are going to move like this and it will go through the Hall effect sensor. Now the moment something comes in front, for example here, this object has come in front. So what would happen is if this is again a ferromagnetic material, the lines of force are going to be pulled out because of magnetic induction. Okay? So the magnetic lines of force are now being pulled out and they are going like this. Okay? So here the magnetic lines of force are going through the sensor, here they are not going through the sensor. So it is some, uh, something like 1 and 0 here or 0 and 1, whichever way it is uh, configured. So this is 0 and that is 1. So essentially, so uh, once something comes in front of ferromagnetic material, the lines of force will go out and the Hall effect sensor will show that something has come in front. So that is essentially how a Hall effect sensor works. Now these Hall effect sensors are very small and uh, they are not very expensive. So these are basically MEMS based, uh, MEMS uh, MEMS based uh, sensors, okay. so they are very, very small and uh, they are very rugged, they do not have any moving parts uh, on the outside. So they are, they are very small and they are very rugged and because of which they are used for sensing uh, proximity, they are also used in cars, so in cars they are also used for sen uh, sensing, uh, sensing speed. Okay. So if you ever wonder when you look at the speedometer of a car, and you can, when you are travelling in a car, you see that the needle actually shows what is the speed of the car, say for example 40 kilometers an hour or 50 kilometers an hour. So how did it get that uh, speed? So essentially there are two dials if you see in a car, okay. one is showing the engine speed, the other one is showing the, uh, the wheel speed. Okay. So when the car is not moving, the wheel speed will be showing you 0, but the engine speed will be showing you some speed. So how do they measure the engine speed and how do they measure the wheel speed? So essentially uh, in the gearbox, output of the gear, so in the case of a car, in the output of the gearbox, so we have our gear, a uh, gear train uh, which is like this. Okay, so this is my gear train and uh, these gears are being mounted, so this is a gear shaft. So the shaft that comes out, so this is my shaft which is coming out, okay, okay. so this is my input and that is my output. So there would be a small marker there or there would be a small projection and there would be a Hall effect sensor sitting somewhere here. Okay. Now if I see the side view of this, then essentially it will be something like this, so this is my and there is a small uh, marker. Okay. So this is that one which is uh, a small projection on the shaft. So when the, uh, the gear is rotating, that means the engine output is coming to the gear output and it is rotating, what would happen is this is rotating and the Hall effect sensor will be working exactly like this. So you can take this to be uh, one of the projections, this small projection can be looked upon like this. So when it is rotating, the gear is rotating, the Hall effect sensor is picking up the speed of the engine. Similarly when the output of the gear, 
okay after the clutch uh, if the engine if the uh, the engine is moving and the car is moving both are moving but the other condition is when the car is not moving that means the clutch is disengaged and uh, the engine is moving in that case what would happen is uh, the engine speed will be showing some speed and the wheel will be showing no speed okay so there is one more of this after the clutch and uh, that measures the wheel speed so essentially after the clutch is engaged uh, what happens the speed is transmitted onto the wheel and so there exactly the same arrangement is there with the hall effect sensor which can measure the speed of the wheel now okay so in a car we basically me uh, measure the speed of the wheel so wheel speed and engine speed uh, wheel speed and engine speed are both measured by are measured by using hall effect sensors uh, which are of the uh, this type exactly the working is the same so we have seen two kinds of proximity sensors one is the inductive sensor uh, which works on the principle of induction the other is the hall effect sensor which also uses magnetic lines uh, to work the other kind of sensor which we have is a range sensor and this is an ultrasonic sensor which measures the distance of the robot from a particular surface or an obstacle and how this works is uh, we have a ceramic transducer here so this is a piezo crystal so this fellow here is a piezo uh, is a piezo actuator basically so it is a ceramic transducer and if you give it a charge what will happen it will expand so you know the working of a piezo crystal so if you give it charge okay it is going to expand in that direction okay so if it expands in this direction it is going to produce one uh, one uh, one uh, sudden expansion which is a shock something like a shock wave or a wave now uh, so if you are going to activate the if you are going to actuate in a particular sequence so we are going to actuate this in a particular sequence or in a particular frequency so which is shown here okay so we are actuating this means we are giving it a charge in this time intervals like this in that frequency so what is happening this crystal here is going to vibrate in uh, with the same frequency in which it is being activated so here it is going to expand again it will expand again it will expand in the roller okay now when it starts vibrating in a particular frequency there is a resin here this starts vibrating with that frequency so what will happen is ultrasonic waves will start going out from here okay so ultrasonic waves are uh, sound waves essentially ultrasonic would mean sound uh, waves and uh, this waves will start going out from here now the moment it hits an object suppose there is an object it hits the object it will hit and it will come back again okay so if it hits the object and comes back now what this uh, this wave come back, comes back and produces some kind of pressure on the crystal now okay so if you can imagine first of all the wave went out then the wave came back now if the wave uh, came back what would happen it will generate some kind of a pressure on the crystal and uh, in that in that case it is going to produce some charge so essentially a charge uh, produces expansion uh, some mechanical displacement rather so a charge produces uh, mechanical displacement and the reverse is if there is a uh, if there is a mechanical displacement then it is going to produce some charge okay so this is the cycle in which it works so here we can see that uh, the driving signal has been given at this frequency and this is my driving signal driving signal it has hit and come back now when it comes back it generates a charge there and uh, this is the and the time duration from here to here would exactly indicate how far this object was okay because we know the speed uh, the speed of sound in air speed of sound in air so essentially what we are getting is if we know this time interval del t how far we can figure out how far the object is so the object uh, the wave went like this and then came back so essentially in one way it took a distance of del t by 2 to travel 1 and if you know the speed of sound then we know the speed of sound in air so that is essentially the distance in which the object was okay so using this uh, ultrasonic sensor we can find out very easily how far an object is from uh, an obstacle now some uh, interesting things about this uh, ultrasonic sensor is that uh, because it works on the principle that the wave has to go out hit an object and come back and it has to be normal to the surface so if the wave is uh, going out and is hitting the surface at an angle 
So for example, I have a surface, uh, say if my hand is a surface and it is coming back and uh, the wave is hitting like this, exactly normal to the surface, then it will come back and the sensor can see, uh, can uh, receive the wave. But suppose my hand is at an angle and it hits at an angle, then what will, have, uh, what will happen is that the angle of incidence will become angle of reflection and if it is hitting like this, it is going to get reflected and it will go off in some other direction. So if that happens, what will happen? Uh, the wave which is being reflected will not come back to the sensor okay, and hence it will not be sensed. So very often objects which have uh, shapes like uh, cylinders, spheres, these are not seen. So very often this ultrasonic sensor, if you are using it on a mobile robot to sense how far an object is, very often will not see. Essentially because if you have a shape which is something like this, the, the, uh, the angle of incidence is like this, it is not normal to the surface so it will simply go off in that side. So this angle is equal to that angle and uh, this will not come back here. So if this is my sensor, I hit like this, it will just go off in some other direction. Okay. So this is uh, one of the reasons why this sensor, although it is very cheap, it is very, it gives uh, good results, fairly good results, but very often it is not going to see. The second reason it is not going to see is, so this is the first reason why it is not going to see. The second reason it is not going to see is if the ultrasonic wave that is being generated is absorbed uh, by the material. For example, materials uh, like cloth, okay, wood normally absorb ultrasonic waves. And this is uh, the second reason why these sensors uh, sometimes give wrong readings or they do not see. Uh, first is the shape of the object, the second is this wave is absorbed by uh, cloth. For example, a human being uh, when we wear our pants or other dresses that is made of cloth, so this uh, signal will uh, very easily get absorbed by that cloth. So the robot actually will not see that uh, you are probably standing there or even for objects like very soft objects like uh, a thermocol for example, very often it, it absorbs the, uh, the wave. So this is the basic working of the ultrasonic sensor and these sensors are very cheap but very often they do not see. So in a robotics application, uh, when we look at the experimental part of the robotics in the labs, so what we will see is that uh, we do not use one sensor but normally we use more than one sensor. So if you have a mobile robot which is circular, we will have uh, one ring of sensors, one ring of ultrasonic sensors all around the robot and then we are going to do sensor fusion and fuse all the data. So if one is not seeing, uh, then probably the other ones are seeing and then we average the results. So that is one of the reasons why uh, we use sensor fusion to get better, more accurate results. Pressure sensors, uh, pressure sensors are used for sensing pressure and it is shown, uh, the working principle is uh, shown here on the right side uh, bottom and how it works essentially is that uh, there is a layer of uh, conductive rubber or pressure sensitive rubber here, okay, which is uh, conductive rubber. So this is uh, our uh, conductive rubber and we have electrodes which are here. So you can see here these are electrodes, okay, right at the bottom those black ones they are electrodes. So in normal condition there is an air gap between the electrode and uh, the, uh, the conductive rubber. So if you look in the normal condition, this is my electrode okay, and the conductive rubber is sitting here somewhere. So there is an uh, air gap there. Okay. Now the moment I press it, if I press here like uh, I am showing, like shown in this uh, figure at the bottom. So if this is my fingertip and I am pressing it like this, what will happen is this conductive rubber will start uh, getting deformed. So it will get deformed, it will become like this, okay, it will come like this, okay. this is another electrode. So because I am pressing it, what is happening, the conductive rubber is getting into this uh, electrode area in these areas okay. and once because it is conductive and it is getting into that area, what will happen, this and this will shorten up. Okay. So some current is going to flow between this and this depending on how much of the rubber has got inside here. So if you press a lot, a lot of the rubber will get in there and uh, more current is going to flow. Now if you press very little, then uh, less current will flow because uh, less of the rubber will get into this to, into the gap between the electrodes. And that is essentially how uh, this uh, pressure uh, sensors work. So there is some calibration between the, the pressure being applied there and the current that is getting shorted in between these two. Okay. So looking at that pressure versus uh, current calibration, so this is my uh, pressure being applied and this is the current uh, between electrodes. So if it is more or less like that. So by looking at this calibration charge, we can figure out that uh, what is the pressure that was applied. So these are pressure sensors, uh, working principle is uh, shown here. Now uh, uh, 
let us move on to actuators, uh, different kinds of actuators. Now, there are different kinds of actuators uh, which are used. Uh, the, the most commonly type uh, actuators used are electrical, which are uh, stepper motors, DC servo motors or AC motors. Okay. The other type of actuators that are commonly used are pneumatic, which are uh, pressure, they work on air pressure. These are basically piston cylinder. So, this is piston cylinder. Uh, mechanisms. Okay. Then we have hydraulic actuators which are again uh, fluid pressure and these are also piston cylinders basically. Okay. Now we had also talked about uh, uh, advanced actuators, we had talked about the size effect. So when we talked about the size effect, we said that if you want to make a robot which is very, very small, okay, then uh, you probably will not be able to put a DC motor or an AC motor in there. Why? Because if you make uh, DC motors very small, then they can't produce enough torque, so they can't move. Okay, so uh, we'll need some other way of actuating at the micro scale, and that is where we talk about advanced actuators. So these uh, motors are more or less used in uh, in the in uh, micro scale, and uh, they are uh, ultrasonic motors, artificial uh, muscles, and sometimes molecular motors. Now, uh, the most commonly used electrical motors. Now, uh, very often the robot would also be using all three of them in combination. For example, if we have a robot like this which is using, so we have a robot here which is picking up a very large mass, so my mg here, let us say my m is uh, 50 kg, so it is 50 kg here, okay. So mg, let us say mg is 50 kg, okay, so this is a uh, 50 kg. So, this robot has to pick up a weight of 50 kg, which will mean that the torque that is going to come on the joint is going to be 50 kg into that distance, right. So, this is my uh, mg into the distance d and this is my mg, right. So, from this figure you can understand that the maximum torque that the robot has to support comes at the base joint. So, this is my base, okay. So, very often in industrial applications when they have to lift very, very heavy weights, if you go to the industries, you will find that the base is very often hydraulic. So, the base joint is actuated by hydraulic system. Okay. Why? Because uh, this hydraulic systems can produce very, very large pressures. They can produce very, very large forces and torques as compared to pneumatic and electrical systems. Uh, so, the base joint of a robot very often is uh, made up of, of uh, hydraulic actuators, which is basically a piston cylinder mechanism. Now, uh, so that is the base. And uh, now, if you come to the end effector again, so, the end effector is very often uh, pneumatic. Now, why is it pneumatic? Pneumatics have some advantages over hydraulics and electrical is that pneumatics can be back driven. So, this normally would have low force okay, and you can back drive them. What is the meaning of back drive? It essentially means that if the robot is uh, suddenly making contact, for example, the robot is moving or you have, uh, let me draw it here. So, we have uh, a gripper and this is holding an object okay. and suddenly because of some disturbance, because of uh, some problem in the programming or because of error, an object comes and hits this okay. so, there is a very high impact with this object okay, in this direction or in this direction. Now in the case of, uh, so this is a gripper which can open and close, so it can move in this direction. It is actuated by piston cylinder mechanism. Now, in the case of electrical system, because there will be a motor, there is going to be a gear sitting in front, you cannot drive the system backwards. So, what will happen is if a sudden impact comes or a sudden load comes, then uh, the gear will break or the, or the link will break because you cannot go backwards because of high gear ratio and high friction. Similarly, in the case of hydraulic system, because there is so much, uh, the, uh, the systems are very strong, okay, so it is very difficult to back drive it. So, again the same problem will come that if you have a sudden impact, you cannot go backwards. But the advantage of this pneumatic system is that uh, it has, it works on air pressure. So, the forces being applied is much lesser than hydraulic or electrical. And the major advantage is that you can back drive it. So, if you have a piston cylinder mechanism, if you can imagine here, so this is a piston cylinder mechanism. If this is suddenly uh, hit by a impact force or an external force, what will happen? This will just move backwards. So, in this gripper mechanism, if this is suddenly subjected to a force, what will happen? The gripper will just move back and it will drop the object. Nothing more will happen. Okay. Whereas, if it was electrical or it was hydraulic, there was a high chance that uh, something will break somewhere. Okay. 
So, that is one of the reasons why the pneumatic systems are used for the end effector. Now, in between the base joint and the end effector normally we are going to use electrical systems. Now, electrical systems can give uh, power which is uh, in between hydraulic and uh, pneumatic, but the advantage of electrical systems is that they do not require a compressor. So, in hydraulic you need a compressor, again in pneumatic you need a compressor, electrical you do not need a compressor and it is very easy, it is much easier to control electrical systems, okay. but they have the disadvantage of uh, uh, not being able to move backwards or back driving is not possible. So, in a robot very often you would find that all the three actuators are used. The hydraulic actuators are used at the base, the pneumatic actuators are used uh, at the end effector and the electrical actuators are used in between. Okay. But uh, about 90 percent of actuators used would be electrical, again because they do not require compressors, they are uh, much easier to control and they are much smaller in size. So, let us look at them uh, one by one. So, the first electrical uh, actuators we will look at are stepper motors, then we will look at uh, DC servos, then we will look at pneumatic and hydraulic systems. Now, we had talked about the mapping when we talked about singularity. So, we had talked about singularity and uh, we said that singularity is essentially happening when this uh, uh, x dot is equal to j into theta dot and we want to find theta dot is equal to j inverse of x dot when this fellow does not exist or determinant of j, uh, determinant of j becomes equal to 0. Okay. So, there is a mapping that is going from the actuator space to the joint space to the end effector space. So, if you just think a little bit, there is a robot link which is like this, how is it working? There is a, a motor actuator which is sitting here. So, there is a motor, there is a gear and there is an encoder right? and we give voltage to the motor, the motor rotates. So, when the motor rotates theta changes and when theta changes x y changes. So, there is a mapping from the actuator space which is volts this is at the motor space. Then at the joint space, this is theta and theta dot and theta double dot and this is the end effector space which is x y. So, x dot uh, and x double dot similarly y and y dot and y double dot. Okay. So, essentially what we are saying is that there is some mapping and this mapping is not 1 is to 1 always. Uh, why? Because uh, there is a Jacobian and the Jacobian has all terms like sine terms and cos terms because of which uh, you can have different kinds of mapping and it is not a linear 1 is to 1 mapping all the time. So, we need to be careful about to when we are trying to control the system which we will see subsequently that because of this Jacobian sitting there, okay, uh, we have to be very, very careful about singularities and uh, what is the actual force transmissions going on. So, uh, let us move on and look at some of the actuators. The first actuator we will look at is the uh, stepper motor which is uh, uh, probably the simplest uh, actuator and how it works is essentially we have uh, we have this is my stator. So, unlike a DC motor, the stator of the stepper motor is made up in uh, made up of uh, poles of this nature okay, so, or a number of teeth or poles. So, teeth or poles it is not continuous. So, we have a number of poles here like they are number 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 and it is there are windings of coils on that. So, if I activate, activate the coil what would happen it will generate a magnetic uh, field in there okay, by magnetic induction again. Now, this is the stator part. Now, in the rotor you see again the rotor part is not uh, smooth, but it has number of teeth like that. Okay. And uh, how it works essentially is this one if it is ferromagnetic or it is a permanent magnet. So, it can be ferromagnetic or it can be a permanent magnet the rotor uh, either way. So, how it works is uh, in this condition if you see if we activate this coil what will happen is this will generate a magnetic field and this being ferromagnetic there will be a magnetic flux induced in there. So, if it is inducing a magnetic field into this what will happen it will also generate if, if I say this is my north south this is my south north uh, this is my south north what will happen this will this will be attracted towards that. Okay. So, what we do is we activate one pole at a time and at one time one of the teeth gets aligned with that by magnetic uh, induction. The next time we are going to align, uh, we are going to activate this one, then this one, then this one, this one. The result would be if you activate this, this will go and get attracted there. If I activate this, this will get attracted there in the in that sequence. So, what we will see is that essentially this is rotating in the uh, clockwise direction. Now, if I want to reverse it, then what I will do is I will reverse my sequence of activation. I will activate this one first, then this one, then this one, then this one and this will go in the reverse direction. So, this is a figure which is showing the uh, rotation and the activation sequence. So, this is my 1, 
it is getting activated, uh, this is getting activated, so it is inducing a magnetic field in there and this fellow is getting aligned with this now. The second is, this is getting activated, the second pole, so the number 5 has come there, this is third and this is my uh, fourth, okay. So in this sequence 1, 2, 3, 4, okay, so 1, 2, 3 and uh, 4, what we found is this was rotating in a clockwise direction, right. Now if I reverse the sequence, I say it is 4, uh, 3, 2, 1 then essentially it will start going uh, counterclockwise. So this is clockwise and this is counterclockwise, okay. So this is how essentially a stepper motor works and as the name indicates it is moving in steps and hence we call it a stepper motor. This has some advantages, uh, first of all is that uh, the cost is low, uh, the cost is pretty low and uh, it is moving in steps. So it is moving in steps and the step size is normally 1.8 degrees, okay. So uh, for a stepper motor, it moves in steps of 1.8 degrees. So every step would be 1.8 and this will also mean that you can operate this in open loop system. So we do not need to go in for closed loop system, we can use this in open loop because we know that every step is 1.8. So if I want to move by a particular angle, I just have to divide that into number of steps and then I can go by that many steps, so I do not need feedback. So uh, the cost is low, the, you do not need a very complex controller, complex controller is not required, so a very complex controller is not required, a very simple uh, microcontroller based, con, uh, based system can actually move a stepper motor in steps. Now if you look further here. Uh, now if we activate this coil, what would happen is, so if I activate this coil here, okay, uh, so if I activate this coil here, what would happen is magnetic lines of force are going to be induced in this and this will get pulled onto there. Now suppose I activate this or uh, let me look at it here. So suppose I activate two coils at the same time, suppose I activate this one and I activate this one, then what will happen is this, this pole here will go and stop somewhere in between. Okay, why? Because it is getting activated, it is getting attracted both by this one and by this one, so it is going and sitting exactly in between. So if it is sitting in between, then it is 1.8 1, 1 by 2, which is equal to 0 0.9 degrees, okay. Now suppose I activate it uh, or energize it, this one I energize 70 percent and I energize this one 30 percent, okay. Then what will happen is this will go more towards that, so it will go more this, okay, because this is stronger it will not go exactly there, but it will go more towards that side. So I can actually uh, step this motor in what we call micro steps. So by controlling the voltage that I am going to offer between this and this, what I can do is I can do, I can break this up into small number of steps, okay, and this is what is called uh, micro stepping, okay. So in micro stepping essentially uh, the the stepper motor can go in very, very small uh, steps and today we have micro steppings which can go in as small as 0.1 degrees also, simply by using this uh, principle that they are going to activate different poles together in a particular ratio. So uh, stepper motors are, uh, are still used for industrial applications for, uh, for indexing, for example, when you are indexing. So indexing is a process in which you are going to go by fixed number of steps, okay. So stepper motors are used for indexing. Uh, they are also used for very simple uh, robots which have maybe 2 or 3 degrees of freedom. One of the major problems of uh, stepper motors, so problems of stepper motors is that the first problem is that it is very heavy, okay, because it is uh, using permanent magnets and is using ferromagnetic material. So uh, the weight of the motor is very heavy, so you cannot put it at the end effector of a robot. So you cannot mount a stepper motor at the gripper or towards the end of the links because it will require a lot of torque just to carry that weight. The second thing is it tends to pick up noise and uh, it may not be not very accurate, which means that it is going to miss steps. So this is working on the sequence of giving steps to each one of them, but uh, in case it is going to pick up noise from some other, some other place, okay, what would happen is uh, it, will, it may start missing steps. Okay. And uh, because of it is an open loop, if it is missing a step, you do not know that one step has gone okay. uh, and hence it is not very accurate. So there, although this is a very cheap solution, very cheap actuator, 
it has problems like uh, it is very heavy in weight, it uh, picks up noise and it can start missing steps. We have uh, linear stepper motors, the working of which is uh, exactly the same. So in this case also we have a rotor and a stator. So this is my, uh, this is my uh, rotor and that is my stator. Okay, so this, the, the bigger one here shows how it works. So essentially what we are uh, trying to do here is uh, we have a permanent magnet, uh, we have a magnet which, sorry, we have uh, uh, this ferromagnetic material and we have coils in there. Okay. So, if I activate this what will happen is a magnetic lines of force will be generated uh, from here and this will attract this part here. Okay. The next I activate this coil, I put this off and I activate this one. So, what will happen number 4 is getting activated, so it will pull this one near to itself. Then number 2 is being activated and then number 3 is being activated. So, if you see this very carefully, first it is here, then it is here, then it is here, then it is here and as a result of which uh, this part has moved in a particular direction. So, first it is here then when it is 4, what is happening, this fellow is getting pulled this side, okay. Then it is 3. So, uh, as, a, as a result of this activation in a particular sequence, what is happening, the rotor is moving in a particular direction. So, these are uh, linear stepper motors and again they are moving in steps, they can be used in uh, uh, work tables. So, in work tables of CNC machines. So, in work tables we can use uh, uh, the stepper motors, linear stepper motors for moving the work table in a particular direction. Working of DC motor, we have already covered that this is how the basic DC motor works and uh, we have a rotor and a stator. So, the stator is a permanent magnet here and the rotor is uh, a coil. Okay. And uh, there are brushes which I explained uh, in the early part of today's class that there are brushes and basically contact is being made with the carbon brush and the commutator. Uh, the advantages is that it is cheap, uh, it works uh, pretty well, but the disadvantage being is this carbon brush, it starts sparking, it will get worn off. So, industrial applications normally do not use, uh, so industrial applications, industrial, so industrial robots uh, do not use. Uh, brush motors, essentially because of the problems of wear and tear, sparking, uh, etc., high friction. So, uh, because of that high friction at the starting and the ending, it is not going to be linear anymore. Okay. So, uh, the uh, what industrial motors are uh, or, or industrial robots use is basically brushless uh, DC motors. Now, if you look at the fundamental difference of construction between a brush motor and a brushless motor, in a brush motor the coils are in inside. So, in this figure if you have a look, then we see that the coil, this is the coil right on the rotor, it is inside. So, the coil is the one that is moving, so that is the rotor and the magnet is outside. So, we see here the coil is inside and the magnets are outside. But if you are looking in the case of a brushless motor, then what we see is that uh, the coils are outside, so the coil is outside and uh, the magnet is inside and basically the magnets are inside on the rotor. Okay. So, uh, the, this is like this is an inverse, inverse of the other, so one is uh, the, uh, just a reverse or inverse condition of the other. Now, uh, this is a brushless motor, so how we activate it is uh, or what we are trying to say is in this case the commutator is the one that is uh, changing the polarity as this is moving. Okay, that is how these uh, the construction of the commutator is or the function, but in this case also we need to change the polarity. So what we do is we use four uh, uh, we use four Hall effect sensors in four in one eighty degrees sorry one twenty degrees. So these are Hall effect uh, sensors. So these Hall effect sensors basically tell us that where this fellow is, where the rotor is when it is rotating at a particular instant. Okay, and based on that we can electro electronically switch the commutation or based on that we can electronically activate the coils as required, okay, which was being done in the case of a brush motor by the commutator. So, now what we are saying is we have uh, Hall effect sensors which are placed at 120 degrees and this uh, based on the readings of those Hall effect sensors, the controller can find out where the position of this, uh, uh, not position, but the speed of uh, the rotor is and based on which it can control the speed. Okay, and uh, based on which it can sequence the activation of the coils and this is what is called electronic commutation. 
So, this is what we call by electrolytic commutation. Okay. Now, because of this electronic commutation, the cost of the uh, motor is much higher uh, compared to a brush uh, uh, compared to a brush motor. A brushless motor will require electronic commutation, which means a lot of more electronics. It will need a controller. So, uh, the cost of this is much much higher. But the advantage being that there are no brushes, so it is brushless. So the problems of uh, wear and tear, sparking, uh, high friction, all those are gone. So industrial applications, so industries. Industrial applications for automation and robotics use uh, brushless DC motors. And uh, brushless DC motors have the advantage that they do not have brushes and control is uh, complicated, they are more expensive. But for industrial applications, they have long life, they have less friction, etcetera. Now, it is very interesting to note that uh, uh, why the cost is so high. So, why the cost is uh, high here, okay? the cost of this motor is extremely high. Essentially, because this magnets that we see, magnets are special purpose, uh, uh, are very special magnets. Now, unlike in this case where you can put heavy magnets, why? Because the rotor is rotating, but the stator is not rotating. So, if the stator is heavy, it does not matter. But in the case of a brushless motor, what is happening is uh, we know that the torque of a motor is equal to j into theta double dot, okay? j is the uh, inertia of the uh, rotor. So, if you want high torque, you must have uh, very high accelerations, okay? that is how you will get your high torque. But if you have very high j, then control is going to become very, very difficult. Then control is difficult, that you can understand. That if the rotor is having a very high mass or very high inertia, so to stop it and to control it very, uh, uh, very finely would be extremely, extremely difficult. So because of which, this magnets here, the special magnets, they have to be very strong, but they have to be very light. Okay? And that is uh, a technology which very few countries in the world have of making this magnets, special purpose magnets or special materials, which are basically the rare earth uh, materials. So, these magnets are basically made up of uh, uh, rare earth materials uh, and uh, these are very thin flames, which are, uh, which are very low which are very light, they have very low mass, but are very, very strong magnetic lines of force. And uh, because of which, this, uh, this brushless motors are very, very expensive uh, to make. Okay? And very few countries in the world have the technology essentially of making these magnets. Okay? Now, uh, the working of a servo motor. So, when we basically talk about a servo motor, so if you have a motor which is working in closed loop control, then basically we call it a servo motor. So, a DC motor which is in a feedback loop in a control system like this in a feedback control motor, we will basically call it a DC servo motor. So, that is where the name uh, servo comes from. Pneumatic actuators are essentially uh, piston cylinder mechanisms and uh, you know how uh, piston cylinders work. So, essentially this is a piston cylinder mechanism which you can see here. So, uh, uh, depending on where the air is inlet, so we have a piston cylinder in which if I put the air inlet from here, what would happen if the air inlet is coming from here? or from here, it will tend to push the piston in this direction. Similarly, the, if the air inlet is coming from here, it will tend to push the, so, if, so let me uh, look at it this way. So, if the inlet is from here, it will tend to push the piston in this direction. Okay? Now, if the inlet is from here, it will tend to push the uh, piston in the other direction. So, if I just draw it, so we have two outlets and we have a piston cylinder here. Okay? So, if I push, push uh, the inlet is from here, the piston will move in this direction. So, if the inlet is from here, then it is going to move in this direction. right? So, essentially depending on which side the uh, air inlet is, it is going to move in that respective direction. Now, the, there are other kinds of motors which uh, uh, are used for micro devices. So, some of those motors are given here. One is ultrasonic motor, artificial muscle and molecular motors. So, ultrasonic motor, how does it basically work is uh, unlike a DC motor, we have a rotor and we have a stator. But in this, the structure of the stator is something like this. It has, uh, it is made up of piezo material, and it has number of teeth like this. So this is the actual uh, motor which is being see, uh, seen here. So you can see here that there is a very small, small teeth, and which is being shown here. Now this being piezo, so this is a ceramic piezo. So what happens with the piezo is, if I give it a charge, it is going to suddenly expand. 
that is something we saw. So, if I give a charge to this in a particular sequence, then what will happen is now this is going to expand. So, suppose I start in this direction, this will expand, this will expand, and this will expand. Okay? So, in that sequence. So, when this expands, this will give a small kick to this one. Okay? And if I give it a small kick to this one, what will happen? It will tend to move in this side or that side. Right? So, unlike a DC motor where the rotor and the stator are uh, not in physical contact, in this case the rotor and the stator are in physical contact here okay? and there is some friction between them. And how it works is the stator has this small, small teeth and which are made up of piezo material. We give it a particular sequence of activation and it gives a small kick here, small kick here, small kick here and based off all this one moves. And the construction of the ultrasonic motor is shown here. So, we have the stator which is this one and this is the rotor. And these are very commonly used in cameras and in micro motion devices. So, basically, what we are seeing here is uh, 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 this uh, ultrasonic motor, which can be used for very small applications like cameras, they are very strong and uh, they work in uh, based on the ultrasonic principle of uh, pr using an ultrasonic uh, wave generator, which is being created by using this uh, piezo crystal in this, in this way. The other kind of actuators are uh, ionic polymers. So, ionic polymer we had covered earlier. So, these are electroactive polymers. Now, depending on uh, how we give a charge, they will uh, move in a particular direction. So, this is a polymer. Uh, so, this is an electroactive polymer and this electroactive polymer basically works based on the charge. So, if you give a charge in this direction, it will move this side and if you give a charge in the reverse direction, it will go in the reverse side. So, these are electroactive polymers and uh, we had uh, covered the, so this is uh, showing an electroactive polymer. So, this uh, bird is made up of uh, uh, EAP or electroactive polymer and giving a particular charge in a particular uh, direction, we can make it bend in different directions. Now, this very basically shows us the, uh, the comparison between ionic polymers, electroactive polymers ceramics which are basically piezos and this is shape memory alloys. So, basically this table gives us the displacements. We see displacement is very large in electroactive polymers, but very small in ceramics, uh, but the voltage required is low here, it is high there. And uh, when we are going to choose a smart actuator, okay, uh, we need to refer to this table to see that what is our displacement that we require versus force. Okay. So, this gives high displacement, but gives very less force. This gives less displacement, but very high force. So, depending on that, we can choose uh, smart actuators, which are piezos or uh, SMAs or using IPMCs. So, today we will stop here and uh, uh, we are going to continue in the next class uh, on uh, linear control of uh, manipulators. So, thank you.